In this series of conversations, we'll be discussing global food sustainability with guests who bring a deep understanding of the environmental and cultural challenges facing our society, and creative ideas on how to address them. I'm Ash Sweeting, and welcome to The Ash Cloud. Today we are joined by Mary Shellman, the former Director of Agribusiness at Harvard Business School, and a thought leader in global food sustainability. Mary also led the creation and implementation of Origin Green, the world's only national food sustainability program based out of Ireland. I welcome Mary to discuss how we can inspire people to address some of our crucial food system challenges. So I think the, the one thing I would come back to at the end, you know, this is the most important industry in the world. There's without a doubt, right? And I think the thing that we don't do enough is to make that case for our young people that you today are so concerned about climate and um, something like 70% of them suffer from something called eco-anxiety. They're so concerned about, you know, the world that like one in four of them say that they're not going to have children because they think that the world's going to be a much worse place more, you know, in the future than it is today. Farms are much more than food production systems. How do we identify and then value all the impacts of farms on our society and environment? How do we get farmers to think about, you know, not just thinking about, you know, what is my yield per acre or per animal, but how do you think about it on an enterprise basis, right? You know, what's the value of the fence row? What's the value of, you know, the creek that runs through my farm in Kentucky and the forests that are there that I have? So we talk about, you know, is food not valued enough? Um, the other piece that's not valued enough are these ecosystem services that farms and farming offer. The existing paradigms need to be reevaluated. But you think about the U.S., right, and maybe the world, there's a message out there that says fresh is best. But when you think about that fresh is best, you know, you're automatically putting waste into the system, right? Because if you, you know, if you, you know, freeze it the minute it comes out of the field, if you can it the minute it comes out of the field, we know, especially with frozen, that you actually have a higher nu nutrient content. There's a lot we can learn from the past, especially about waste. For generations and generations and, you know, nothing went to waste, right? And you look today at our luxuriousness, when I would go like visit them on the farm, there was never any waste because whatever you didn't eat was taken out. It was either fed to the hogs, as slop, and turned back into food again, or it was fed to the dogs and the cats. So we used to have this really nice circular economy, you know, you know, kind of pig production in China, right? You know, a couple of pigs in the backyard, you know, they kept your house warm because, you know, maybe they were underneath you in the wintertime. Is a strategy of low cost food the best approach? And is cheap food sufficiently valued? You can either be low cost, you can be differentiated. And kind of thinking about that's, you know, that's kind of the, the challenge in front of the food system right now, right? You know, do you have this, this strategy to where you have low cost products that are, you know, affordable and accessible and nutritious and, you know, you can get nutrition to the masses, not just in the U.S., but all around the world and, um, you know, bring it out? Or do you have this maybe a more luxurious strategy of premium products that have, you know, more sustainability attributes into it? Continuing along the current path may soon no longer be an option. Business as usual is likely to be an open invitation for increasing regulation. We don't meet our climate com commitments. You're going to be like legislated out of business, right? You know, you're going to lose your license to operate, which is the scariest thing to me now. If we don't have these conversations that I'm talking about, that if we don't act as a you know, more coordinated industry level to be able to say, this is our plan, this is why it's relevant, and this is what's going to happen and why it's so important. Um, you know, we look at what's going on with New Zealand and dairy. We look at what's going on in you know, the Netherlands with you know, the, the pork industry, with Denmark, with the pork industry. I mean, these are countries that are kind of legislating their way, you know, regulating their way out of things that have been very important to their economies. And what ends up happening then is that you're actually, you know, pushing production to someplace else in the world of where the environmental footprint is worse. Currently, 
there's no globally accepted definition of sustainability. What are we actually talking about with sustainable food? When we talk about sustainability, do we talk about a sustainable farm? Do we talk about a sustainable, do we talk about sustainable agriculture? Do we talk about a su sustainable food um, or a sustainable food system? Saying you're sustainable today isn't enough. You actually need to be able to prove it. So you need some data to back it up other than the fact that you've managed to hung on and maybe grow your operation and things like that. The challenges are complex and difficult. The value of cooperation and persistence should not be underestimated. First of all, there's no like silver bullet answer to it, right? So this was an activation process that took two years, you know, from, from basically the conception idea to launch. When we first started talking about that shared vision, the, we were basically laughed out of the room by the CEOs of these food companies. And by the time we went through this two-year process of, you know, putting this program in place, it went from wow, you know, this will never happen right. We can't agree with anybody, right? You know, we're used to competing in global markets, not working together to, oh my goodness, why don't we, why couldn't we have this sooner? We cannot underestimate the link between our food systems and our health. What is it that really matters? You know, is food valuable? Yes, but nutrition is more valuable than food, perhaps. You know, the cost in the U.S. today, certainly in my home state of Kentucky, uh, you know, um, to treat illnesses that are related to poor dietary choices is huge. It's vital to think of the big picture. One of the most insightful comments I've ever heard about farming came when I was visiting a good friend of mine in New Zealand, and she was a professor at Massey University, but also she and her, her husband have a what I would have described as a dairy farm, and I was, was with them, and she said, no, Mary, it's like, we're not dairy farmers. What we, our job in New Zealand as farmers is to grow grass. Our job is to grow the best crop of grass we can ever grow, and then we make a processing decision. What do we want to turn that grass into? Do we want to turn it into, you know, into to, to milk production? Do we want to turn it into, you know, beef, into sheep, into, you know, um, you know, venison and i just thought that if you kind of focus on that fundamental like we want from this soil this precious you know soil and resources we have to to do the best that we can with it right and if you're thinking about your job is growing grass maybe you move that that herd in a different rotation right in order to keep that grass right to where it comes back again <laughs> Mary, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, thank you, Ash. I'm looking forward to it. So in, in our societies, we have some different conversations going on in the rural space, in the food and ag space, compared to what's going on within the more urban societies in terms of how they see sustainability, but also how they see the priorities in terms of sustainability. And at the end of the day, we live on one planet, so everyone needs to be on the same page. And if we can all be addressing the problems together, that's going to be uh, more beneficial. So how do you see, I guess, those two conversations and how they vary and then ways we can build bridges between those urban people, which are essentially the market for all that food that's being produced mm -hmm. and the farmers who are producing the food? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I've spent my last 35 years or so in Boston, but, you know, grew up in Kentucky, very much part of a, you know, more of a rural um, economy. My dad was a local farm equipment dealer, and I was always going out with him to the local farms. And, you know, you're, you're so right. I think it's, you know, it's, you know, you've got kind of this rural urban divide, but you also have this kind of, in the U.S. at least, and kind of this East Coast, West Coast versus middle of the U.S. divide as well. Um, you know, and then we get, we get into the issues around sustainability, you know, one, um, you know, where the biggest challenges, I think, is it's, there's no definition of it that is globally accepted. Um, and in some ways, it's a moving target, right? Because when, you know, kind of it popped up on the, you know, people's agendas, maybe, you know, more seriously for the first time back, right, in, you know, 2007, 2008, at least related to food. Um, with, you know, the big strike in global food prices um, and, 
you know, at the same time, we had this global recession going on. And so we had some critical events. It's like, oh, wow, you know, um, there's, you know, maybe tension in the system and maybe looking out to the future, you know, we have, you know, bigger population, they're eating different things, a limited set of natural resources to push, you know, to promote to, you know, to, uh, you know, to produce those with, um, you know, so a lot of it, the early conversations were around the environment and clearly that's still an important part, but then we kind of wrapped into that, right? You know, animal welfare, child labor, uh, you know, treatment of workers, human health. And it's just, so when we, we look at these conversations now, you know, people are, you know, they, they can kind of find the one dimension they like and push on it. Um, and maybe leave the others. And so for a number of years, I've been asking this question about, you know, are we, when we talk about sustainability, do we talk about a sustainable farm? Do we talk about a sustainable, do we talk about sustainable agriculture? Do we talk about a su sustainable food um, or a sustainable food system? And kind of depending on your lens there, you get different sets of, you know, answers. And I think that's a, you know, a big challenge, but you know, so many of the, you know, the farmers that I've talked to over the years, I mean, they always start with, of course, we're sustainable, right? You know, we, we, you know, this is particularly if it's a family farm, you know, we've been here for a long time, we're still here today, and we want to make sure that it's, it's going forward into the future. And, um, you know, but the, my challenge to them, or my question to them is, you know, I, being, saying you're sustainable today isn't enough, you actually need to be able to prove it. So you need some data to back it up, other than the fact that you've managed to hung on and maybe grow your operation and things like that. But um, kind of getting into that question about, you know, how can we maybe help enable those conversations? The first, the first point that I always say when we're talking about this subject is that um, consumers, you know, the answer is usually we need to educate consumers. And it's like, well, that's great, but consumers don't want to be educated. You know, you push back on that, right? You know, consumers, you know, they want to engage now. They, they think they're empowered. So, you know, how do we do that? You know, we can invite them into our operations. We can actually show them how things are done, you know, kind of give them that lens. Um, the second piece of it is, is that you have to start young, you know, like really young, you know, the, you know, I think about, you know, kind of the, the youth today. I went to a, a conference back in May and I listened to uh, an author speak and she had written a book about kind of taking, you know, kind of green steps one at a time. And she cited the fact that like 70, that, that you today are so concerned about climate. We think they're on social media that they're talking about, you know, like, you know, boys or movies or whatever. And they're actually talking about, you know, these kind of big social issues and um, something like 70% of them suffer from something called eco-anxiety. They're so concerned about, you know, the world that like one in four of them say that they're not going to have children because they think that the world's going to be a much worse place tomorrow, you know, in the future than it is today. I think that's very sad, but we have to, you know, but that just says that we need to, to start early. Um, you know, maybe the answer is like fourth grade, not even, you know, high school. And um you know, I love the idea of things like, you know, community gardens, uh, you know, gardens at school, anything that you can actually allow someone who's not been involved in agriculture to go out and realize the challenges that come with actually trying to grow something and to produce food that you, you eat at the end of it. So I, I think there, you know, there's a number of, you know, ways to, to go about this, but you know what you've talked about is a huge issue. I think there are two very interesting points you made there. One is urban people needing to educate farmers or farmers needing to educate the city folk. And you know, most of us hate being told you must do this or you're wrong about your thinking. I think there's enough evidence, be that within the US or within our broader geopolitical. Yeah. Uh, situations that ha that has that is not a, a road to success. So how you actually establish those conversations? Uh, so it's not educating, but more sharing experiences. And it was an interesting. Another thing that happened to me last year, I was actually at Harvard Medical School for um, meeting with a professor there on in the longevity space, and there were some younger guys there, and the topic of a mentor or mentorship came up. 
And actually what was discussed is that everyone of our generation should have a mentor that's under 25. And so, you know, make us more in touch with uh, with the younger people and, and hearing their voices and stuff like that. So I think there's some fascinating angles there. Is there anything you have to add to that? Yeah, you know, Ash, you know, that last piece of it about a mentor is, you know, for us is, um, you know, I think that that's really important because it's easy, you know, just like our, you know, our parents and grandparents, you know, poo-pooed what we did when we were young, you know, the music was bad, the, you know, the work ethic was bad, everything was, you know, bad. And then, you know, we get to that spot that, you know, we're also saying those things, um, you know, so we need to see, I think the brilliance and the passion um of the you know of this younger generation and figure out how to harness it in a way that actually can help us solve these problems i think that's the way you get engagement is that you say hey you know we, we realize you know that we've all got a big job to do you know let's let's work together to do this you know you guys are are the future here and but they need models of success right they need stories that show that we've you know malthus back in the, the 60s right you know said you know the world's going to not be able to support itself. And then you have the green revolution, right? So technology is a huge piece of these solutions. So how do you, you know, get into these, you know, bring it into these conversations about, you know, kind of reinventing the food system, evolving the food system, transforming the food system, as opposed to like creatively, we have to destroy the food system and build it, build it back again, which is, you know, kind of scary to think about because we have done a tremendous job and even the numbers, you know, you know, kind of before the latest go around with the, you know, global, the economic situation right now and the war in Ukraine about, you know, how many, the progress that we had made on a global level about, you know, pulling people out of poverty, but also getting access to, to, to better diets is, is significant. And nobody tells that story, right? You know, nobody kind of, and that doesn't, that means that you don't have any hope for the future if you never hear about the progress that was made in the past. The second piece of it, I think, um, is something that um, I heard at another panel I was moderating, um, and it turned the you know. So how do you you know engage with this you know this kind of younger generation that you know do things like you know they do like you know e gaming as a major in university now. So you know e sports. Like what is this? You know how can you have a major in e sports and then. You know, I heard that the, the U.S. dairy industry is working with this influencer um, by the name of Mr. Beast. And I don't have anybody in my household, really, that, you know, that's kind of in that Mr. Beast generation. But, um, but I talked to some other people, some other parents, and I'm like, oh, man, we know about M Mr. Beast. Turns out Mr. Beast, you know, has like 114 million subscribers to his YouTube channel. Um, and his... And his, um, you know, the videos on that YouTube channel had like 20 billion views. Wow. I mean, it's just a staggering number, right? And then I heard that the dairy industry is actually working with Mr. Beast, you know, to get him to, you know, to promote dairy in some ways um, as being part of a healthy diet. It's like, that's how you reach a group as you find the, you know, what's important to them or the voices that they do listen to and you you know, you bring those people on to, to your side. Now, I know Mr. Beast also has promoted some things that may be contrary to what we would like in the industry. Um, maybe, you know, kind of, you know, plant-based milks and other things like that. But, you know, you get, you need to, to, to understand that that's an important channel and we need to be part of these new conversations, right? As opposed to, you know, with the traditional, you know, media approaches that we might be thinking about. Yeah, so many, so many points come to mind with what you've said there, I think. One, the you know it's a broad conversation. There's eight billion of us now on the planet. There's uh, not all of us have the same choices or um, the same desires or ambitions or, or tastes. So I don't think you know we need to be. And I think social media has probably played into the cer a certain amount that's kind of sent us more into these silos and in many ways we need to be speaking to people who we might not agree with, or at least might not agree with on anyone because, you know, find avenues to broaden those conversations rather than go to that comfortable place where we feel, you know, where we feel our, our views are, are mirrored. 
Uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, it's, uh, you know, so I've spent a number of years at Harvard Business School, right? And the, the very simple answers, I'm fascinated by strategy. I've always been fascinated by how businesses work and business strategy. And, you know, and what they teach you at Harvard Business School is really two simple answers. You know, companies can have, you know, industries can have, you know, two st strategies, right? You can either be low cost, or you can be differentiated. And kind of thinking about that's, you know, that's kind of the, the challenge in front of the food system right now, right? You know, do you have this, this strategy to where you have low cost products that are, you know, affordable and accessible and nutritious and, you know, you can get nutrition to the masses, not just in the US, but all around the world and, um, you know, bring it out or do you have this maybe a more luxurious strategy of premium products that have, you know, more sustainability attributes into it, um, you know, built into it, you know, certainly important to do and but sometimes they lead in a way that then pulls up everything else and the folks that maybe need the you know the nutrition the most um you know are then kind of blocked out and maybe off to less nutritious products i think about the you know debate around, around cage free eggs is the one that that you know comes to mind to me you know, right off. Um, it's funny, back way back in 1995, I was at a conference in Paris, and they were this is early days of the CAP. Um, the and there was someone from Australia there that stood up in the audience, and he said, "I just can't understand why a strategy of cheap food can ever be wrong." And you know, you can see that now, maybe today, that you can't go all the way in that direction um, because there there are certainly an, an unintended consequences around it. But yet, you know, it's uh, it's a fascinating discussion, right? You know, whether you, you know, who it is you're trying to satisfy because uh, people have different needs and a different willingness to pay. Europe has made choices, you know, that put them in that more in that high price camp. But then you look at where some of their production comes from and it comes from, you know, areas of the world like, you know, Brazil, you know, so, yeah. that others that are, you know, maybe not being exploited, but maybe are exploiting in a different way their resources than if you were a European consumer feeling like you're, you know, very virtuous, then maybe if you take a look at that total footprint, it might not be as virtuous as um, you expected it to be. That's very, very interesting, especially the, the bit that you mentioned about the cheap food. And my, my, mother and her parents um they left eastern europe directly after the second world war and moved to australia as refugees and they had lived through the second world war in europe and they had a very different attitude to wasting food than many of my contemporaries today and i guess if things are cheap do we value them enough and that's kind of my lens on that. But is is cheap food actually obviously affordable food is different to cheap food, and we have income variation. So what's affordable to one demographic is not affordable to another one. But that's different to cheap. And is food not valued enough? Is the question I'm guess I'm digging at. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, my parents too, uh, you know, and my grandparents before them, you know, living through the depression, you know, all both sides of the family, you know, on farms, always in farming, but too poor to actually own land um, back in Kentucky, um, you know, for, for generations and generations. And, you know, nothing went to waste, right? And you look today at our luxuriousness. I, I think about it actually in the sense that, um, I, I, you know, when I would go like visit them on the farm, there was never any waste because whatever you didn't eat was taken out. It was either fed to the hogs as slop and turned back into food again, or it was fed to the dogs and the cats. And, you know, and now you look at it, we can't even do that anymore because, you know, the veterinary industry and the pet food industry has turned itself into saying, oh, no, you can't feed your, you know, your, your pet's table scraps. So we used to have this really nice circular economy, you know, you know, kind of pig production in China, right? You know, a couple of pigs in the backyard, you know, they kept your house warm because, you know, maybe they were underneath you in the wintertime. And, you know, and again, you know, your table scraps go down. It's like your bank is there because, you know, you're capturing it and then you, you know, to take them to market. And so a little bit is, have we, you know, caught ourselves, you know, kind of valuing things in, in different ways. The other piece I think about in the U.S., uh, 
a little bit off topic here, but along that area, of, you know, have we kind of let ourselves down a path is that, so my, you know, all my relatives grew up on, on farms and they had huge gardens. So the women spent all their, basically all of their effort, you know, in the summertime you know, kind of growing food and then canning food or freezing food or, you know, whatever it took to get through the winter there. So, you know, I made all these, you know, kind of younger people who have this romantic view about having a garden out back and, you know, canning your own food. And I'm like, no way. You know, I saw that growing up. This is like, you know, we're talking about moving hot baths of tomatoes, you know, in cans, you know, off the stove in a kitchen, you know, the size of a postage stamp and it's 97,000 degrees inside, you know, I want nothing to do with it. But you think about the U.S., right, and maybe the world, it, there's a message out there that says fresh is best. But when you think about that fresh is best, you know, you're automatically putting waste into the system, right? Because if you, you know, if you, you know, freeze it the minute it comes out of the field, if you can it the minute it comes out of the field, we know, especially with frozen, that you actually have a higher nu nutrient content. But yet the, the produce industry, I think, has been done quite a, a good job about convincing us that, um, you know, that, you know, if you don't eat fresh fruits and vegetables every day, then, you know, you're, you're not getting the nutrition you need. And yet you think about how much of it goes bad in our refrigerators, you know, not to mention the supply chain, but, you know, in the U.S., I think in, in a lot of developed places, right? It happens at the refrigerator. It's like, man, I don't know what to do with this, right? I'm, I don't want to eat leftovers again. We ended up, you know, eating out four times this week. So that lettuce that I bought or the pepper or whatever it just gets tossed in the trash, the avocado. And, um, and again, it's what goes back to what you said about kind of not valuing it enough and then maybe not having the skills or the need to like take care of that and, you know, have another meal at home that you have already kind of had so or as well as that like you were um you mentioned the traditional recycling mechanisms yeah. were essentially livestock be they chickens yeah. be they hogs or pigs or or even ruminants that yeah. basically not only recycle the actual food by creating more food but then put the nutrients back into the soil or back into your your vegetable garden you know, it's funny, you know, kind of thinking about that piece of it. I know we were talking about that kind of that balance now, right, that was promoted by COVID, that big question in the world, right? We had a very efficient global supply chain for many things, right? You know, but food was one of those, you know, food travels great distances, you know, it's, you might argue that that's bad from a, you know, mile standpoint, but, you know, from a comparative advantage, you know, standpoint, if you're in Brazil and you have lots of land and water, then you can produce, you know, soy or you can produce, you know, beef and move it around. And basically you're moving water around the world um, that um, to someplace that doesn't have it. Um, but yet on the other hand, you know, so, so we saw during COVID, right, you know, empty store shelves and this big, you know, starting to be questions like, you know, can you have a, should the food system be efficient or should it be resilient? And I go back to my, um, engineering curriculum. So I'm an engineer by training, not that I've ever practiced, but I had a, like my senior class in process design, reactor design for chemical engineering, you know, it's like, okay, you have to do this, like, uh, you know, process, purification process, you know, what types of vessels do you need? What does it look like? And, you know, and you go and you work it all off. And I went in and took it to the professor and he, and he looked at me and he said, that's great, Mary. Now go add 20% to your design. And I'm like, well, what do you mean 20%? You know, because these are the, this is the right answer, right? The numbers are perfect. He said, that's the real world factor. It's the fact that, you know, processes aren't completely stable, right? So you need to handle the highs and the lows. And so go add 20% to the size. And I think that's kind of, you know, is our, it's our food system, whether it's local or, or whether it's, uh, you know, global, it's like you need that 20%. But the unfortunate thing is that you have to produce it. But in the way the system is structured right now, the majority of the time that you don't use it, the cost of that, the penalty of that 20% falls back on the farmer, yeah. right? Because prices come down. And then, you know, it's, you know, it's this tremendous, you know, kind of, you know, cyclic movement, which keeps farmers from being able to really make investments, you know, over the long term that um, they might need to make to adopt, you know, more sustainable practices, you know, whether it's, re, you know, regenerative ag, whatever you want to call it, like better soil health, uh, 
you know, even what I like to think about at the farm level, it's, you know, how do we get, you know, farmers to think about, you know, not just thinking about, you know, what is my yield per acre or per animal, but how do you think about it on an enterprise basis, right? You know, what's the value of the fence row? What's the value of, you know, the creek that runs through my farm in Kentucky and the forests that are there that I have, my son and daughter-in-law were there earlier this year, it just happened to be like on the, during um, migration time that I saw 37 species of birds. Oh, wow. In one day, just, and not, and I think they never moved. They were just down there on the farm, you know, and you know, what's the value of that? So we talk about, you know, is food not valued enough? Um, the other piece that's not valued enough are these ecosystem services that farms and farming offers. And we don't train our farmers to think like that. We don't, we're just now starting to see some incentives in that space. You know, I, I have, you know, land that's in a conservation reserve program in Kentucky, which has been, you know, we've been doing for years and years, which says, okay, you know, this is kind of more sensitive land. We get paid not to farm it um, and to, you know, treat it in a different way. But um you know, like how can we we shift that mindset from what happens from a you know kind of yield standpoint on an acre or an animal to what's that that enterprise value? And there's a couple of interesting, really interesting points in that. One is how you mentioned the risk, and essentially the consumer doesn't take a lot of risk because if a product's not on the shelves, they find something else. And even during COVID, not no one here in the United States, you know, starved to death. They might have not had the choice they had, but they certainly didn't starve. Whereas the farmer's taking the the majority of that risk and they're not necessarily getting the upside from the risk. The other thing, and I think the EU is quite an interesting example in this, um, and I'll take, well, no longer in the EU, but the United Kingdom. And farmers in the UK, people like to drive around the English countryside and see the stone walls and see the lovely hedgerows and have nice small fields and have sheep grazing or cattle grazing in those fields because it feels very, very English. And a lot of the initial subsidies, the EU subsidies that went into those systems, all the subsidies were through, say, the milk price or the, the meat price. And so the subsidies were actually distorting the production economics of the system uh, and the farmers weren't making a lot of money, but the farmers were spending a third or a quarter of or whatever percentage of their time doing countryside management. And it's, it's I guess, I guess it's about aligning the economic um, situation or the economic incentives with the actual work you want done and also how we can share the risks because at the end of the day the way i see it is in some ways the the environments kind of ended up being the overflow for that risk farmers have not looked after things because they haven't been able to afford to look after things as much because that that's where the the, the short term consequences the year by year consequences are less there but the the decade or century by century consequences are much greater there. And that's all going to flow onto urban environments and the rest of us, if we don't get it right, but we can't expect them to take the burden of the risk either. Yeah, no, I think you're right. You know, some of it is what you said, it's, it's, it's strictly a timing thing. So getting back to that, you know, that 1995, you know, the Australian point about how can a cheap food system ever be wrong? You know, the, the kind of the French counterpoint to that, the European counterpoint to that was, is that, you know, people come to, to France and they love to look at the countryside. So, you know, we value the, the beautiful countryside and we, we pay our farmers to keep the countryside nice, right? You know, and not kind of plow fence row to fence row. So what you, you brought up is about aligning um, incentives around, you know, what it is that you want to achieve is, it, you know, I think it's super, super important to think about and that it's not just about, you know, that acre or that, um, that again, that animal there. But um, so I was working with a farmer's market in Birmingham back a number of years ago, and they, they were one of the, the first really brilliant farmers markets in the US, still tremendously brilliant. And that they were trying to figure out how to help. Um, it was an area that you had kind of historically black farmers 
as well down in that area of the world. And they were trying to think about, you know, what they could do to, you know, to provide, you know, to support these historically black farmers. And, you know, they were like talking about creating this market space, you know, more opportunities to come to market. And, you know, my comment to them was, is, you know, you need to also provide some way to kind of like manage the, I won't say manage the supply side of it, but, you know, um, in the sense of controlled what's going on the farm, but give farmers another option because, you know, the big challenge, right, with farmers that grow for a cash market and, you know, take it to, to sell on the weekends is like, you know, you, you get these weather influences, right? If, if, you know, if you're growing tomatoes and everybody's growing tomatoes, it's rainy, 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 rainy. There's no tomatoes on the market. So if you actually have a tomato, you know, that's very high value, but suddenly like it stops raining. Everybody's got tomatoes at the same time. They all come to the market and the price of tomatoes collapses. So I'm like, you know, my advice to the, you know, to this farmer's market was you need to create like a kitchen to go with it. So farmers can turn these fresh products into something that they can have, you know, kind of more manage the, you know, the supply across the year, right? If you talk to a company like Driscoll's, they do the same thing. You know, it's, uh, you know, they look at the, you know, the amount of, you know, berries, high quality berries on the market that, you know, the market can bear and keep, keep price up and, you know, to at a, a premium level as Esprit does the same thing with, with kiwi fruits, you know, and then it's like, you know, whatever doesn't meet the quality standards and might kind of oversupply, you move it someplace else in the market or you turn it into a, you know, a different kind of product that, that you can, uh, you know, don't have to like push it right now you know this minute to where you know you kind of take that risk but um you know in ireland you know farmers that that grow beef cattle kind of manage it the same way because many of them like in kentucky tend to be you know it's kind of like the part their part-time job they're not full-time beef operations and it's like well that's my bank out there if i need to if the prices aren't good i won't take it um, to market. I'll just let it sit out there for a while. If I don't need the money right now, I won't take it to market. Uh, you know, so, but if you're a row crop farmer, you don't quite have that, unless you have on-farm storage, you may not have quite have that same ability to, uh, you know, to manage that piece. Definitely. Farmers need to be better market. I guess the bottom line of that, farmers need to be better marketers as well <laughs> of what they do. And, you know, historically, like, you know, especially in the U.S., right, farmers are generalists. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, kind of diversified farmers like in Kentucky or row crop farmers in there, you know, they, they're like, you know, they, um, you know, it's like they take care of the machinery, they grow a crop, they decide whatever. And the thing is, so, that, so they're, they're, they're good at a lot of things, but maybe not like, you know, super, super expert at all of them. And I think the thing that, you know, often they tend to be the, maybe the least um, skilled at is in the marketing piece of it. So they like, you know, growing it, producing it, you know, and getting that yield. But then it's like, when do I actually sell it? I think that's 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 very spot on. And obviously, there's so many jobs on a farm, and you know, you know, especially kids that grow up and then take over a family farm. You know, marketing's not front and center of any of those kitchen table discussions. I think the actual we we keep on jumping back to France today, but I think the actually the wine industry is a fascinating example of that because. At the end of the day, whether it's a three dollar bottle of wine from somewhere or a you know a ten thousand dollar bottle of of French champagne, at the end of the day, it's fermented grape juice. Of it's it's the same stuff, yeah. tastes yeah. differently, but it's fermented yeah. grape juice. And it's interesting because from my perspective, people people would say I'd never pay five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars for a bottle of wine, but they don't actually. Or they very rarely doubt that it's not worth that much, that other people will. So there's an assumed value, this huge value variation uh, based on fermented grape juice. And, and there's stories about the soil or the climate or the history or whatever. But what do you think there's, in terms of the marketing perspective, the rest of the agricultural industries could learn something from the viticulturalists? Oh, I, I, it's so true. That's a, that's a great story for the, the last, you know, over, you know, something like, you know, 12, 13 years, I've been working with the Irish food industry and uh, they, a colleague and I were invited in back in 2010, back when, you know, the Ireland economic climate was just a disaster, right? You know, collapse of Celtic tiger, all of the, you know, huge debts 
at the financial firms that Ireland had to pay back. Uh, and no real indigenous industry other than agriculture, but at the time was very much commodity focused, you know, beef and dairy, but, you know, sold into international markets without any kind of differentiation at all. And not only differentiation, one, it was, you know, produced at high cost because Ireland's an island. So the costs are higher, um, no matter what. And, um, and you know, we heard the story about like two Irish beef producers would go into a supermarket in Germany and they would undercut each other on price. So not only was it, you know, was it like sold as a commodity, it was sold as a commodity that was pushed down to the lowest possible value of it all. And so my colleague and I were asked to come in and we had this very simple point of view for them. It's like one, you know, like you got two choices, right? You know, two strategy choices. We started there. It's like you either have to be a low cost producer, you have to, to differentiate, right? And, and brand. You're never going to be a low cost producer. So you better choose this differentiation strategy. Um, the second one is that, gee, you better work together because you're so small as a country. I think I accused them of being a rounding error on Nestle's balance sheet, which uh, they still remember to this day being called that. They better work together. And, you know, kind of the third one is you, you need kind of more innovation, more talent in the industry. Um, but if you're going to brand, you have to prove it. And um, so they're all kind of gathered around. And this was all of the CEOs of the, the Irish food industry supported by Board BIA, which is the Irish Food Board kind of semi state agency. And we, we were, you know, having this conversation about wow, you know, Ireland's so small, how can you you brand, you know, there's really nothing there. And so we kind of sell the, on sustainability, which was just kind of emerging as an attribute. And um, it's like, wow, you know, but they're so small. And um, so Irish is the head of Irish distillers at the time. So not wine, but, you know, in the spirits industry um, was Alexander Ricard of the Fenor Ricard family. And he had this most important lesson. He said, it's all about marketing scarcity. It's, you know, this, this is it. So what you talked about, Ash, about, yeah, you've got Tawar and you've got these other things. It's really all about marketing scarcity. And um, so, you know, that was always our, you know, the learning we took away from the, you know, the for the Irish food system is it's like, wow, we have to market the scarcity of the resources that, that Ireland is bringing, which is this, you know, beautiful land and abundant water and, you know, these happy cows that are outside. And, you know, but yet we have to support it with proof. So this, this Origin Green program, which is still the world, I think it's the first and still, the, I think the only national sustainability program in the world that goes all the way through, it's a voluntary program. Um, so, but yet 95% of Ireland's food and drink exports now go out from Origin Green certification. And, um, you know, and it's, it was about aligning the supply chain. And so how do you do that? It was like sharing that vision all the way down, you know, getting the processors to agree, getting them to flow it back down to the, to the farmers to get them on board with it, because you really needed to upskill the farmers to do this. And then collecting the data to support that. So you're marketing scarcity, but supported by data. And I think that, you know, is, uh, you know, a little bit, little about your, your wine story, but with a little more teeth to it. Uh, awesome. I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that's been constantly reinforced, um, basically in pretty much every country I've ever worked in is that the social and cultural challenges are frequently more arduous and complex than the technical challenges. And, in terms of you know what you just described with the origin green island you needed collaboration between agri agribusiness between the farmers mm -hmm. governments had a role there um there's potentially a role for academics and entrepreneurs in that space what can we learn or what can we do differently to better foster that collaboration to i guess overcome those those cultural challenges Oh, uh, yeah. So I think that's, you know, that's exactly the group that we brought together in, um, you know, under the Origin Green umbrella. And it was really masterful. First of all, there's no like silver bullet answer to it. Right. So this was an activation process that took two years, you know, from from basically the conception idea to launch to get everything ready for it. And the launch then was just at basically at the processor level. It wasn't at the consumer level. So one, you know, we had a shared vision 
that, you know, when we first started talking about that shared vision, that we were basically laughed out of the room by the CEOs of these food companies. But um, that vision was based on, it was a very commercial vision. And over the course of kind of coming back and continuing to have conversations at a, at a regular basis, committed to at a regular basis, the, you know, the world was showing signs that like this was actually tremendously relevant to a certain set of consumers and to a certain set of, you know, kind of geographies in the world. And by the time we went through this two year process of, you know, putting this program in place, it went from, wow, you know, this will never happen right. We can't agree with anybody, right? You know, we're used to competing in global markets, not working together to, oh my goodness, why don't we, why couldn't we have this sooner? So you've got the vision, you have a timeline around it that's generous. And then once you got to the processors, they actually had to work down and bring the farmers in. Um, and then the third part, maybe, which was kind of wraps it all together. It was very commercially motivated. You know, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, we're gonna go out and save the world. You know, the earth's gonna be a better place. We can meet our climate commitments. You know, that's how relevant is that if you're on the farm, um, you know, unless you actually wrap it back today to like, we don't meet our climate com commitments, you're going to be like legislated out of business, right? You know, you're going to lose your license to operate, which is the scariest thing to me now. If we don't have these conversations that I'm talking about, that if we don't act as a, you know, more coordinated industry level to be able to say, this is our plan, this is why it's relevant and this is what's going to happen and why it's so important um you know we look at what's going on with new zealand and dairy we look at what's going on in you know the netherlands with you know the, the pork industry with denmark with the pork industry i mean these are countries that are kind of legislating their way you know regulating their way out of things that have been very important to their economies and what ends up happening then is that you're actually you know pushing production to someplace else in the world of where the environmental footprint is worse. And, you know, from that global standpoint, I don't think that's the right answer. You know, I think it's positive. I think this food system, you know, transformation that we need, there's so many pathways out there right now. People are talking about a, um, a frequent kind of a colleague of mine in Dublin and I've developed this paper. We call it the four D's, like four pathways to a sustainable food system um, that that we hear, right? You know, this is, you know, you're looking, we started out by talking about this, you know, people have different answers to what that means. And the first one we we call it kind of, you know, defend, like, it's like, keep doing what we're doing, you know, let's do, you know, do more with less, right? Let's really push on productivity. Let's, you know, kind of, you know, squeeze more out of, you know, all of our resources, you know, and those resources, you got land, but I think water is even more important. You know, and to, and and not you know ignoring sustainability commitments, but you know using technology really you know kind of pushing forward on that that piece of it, and that keeps you know very affordable food. You know, it's a kind of a world of more abundance. Um, second D we talk about is develop, which is like wow, let's take the system we have and like let's find some of these things that people might value more. Um, the sustainability commitments, uh, whether it's grass-fed beef, uh, you know, grass-fed dairy. Uh, you know, something, you know, something that's bee friendly, you know, ice cream that's bee friendly, um, you know, um, you know, dairy that's raised, you know, with, you know, like think about Danone and their their non-GMO approach, even though I think that rhetoric is, has died down in the U.S. tremendously. Um, and, you know, and then kind of differentiate that product, right? You know, go out and find the consumers that you know might be willing to pay for it or maybe you're willing to, you know, more likely buy it versus something else. Um, pay farmers more, communicate more, it takes more communication and it takes more, um, you know, high prices at the farm level or maybe longer term contracts, you know, but certainly more communication in that piece. But yet the two other parts, the two other Ds there where it gets interesting, you know, the, there's a D we call defy, which is like, okay, we want to change the food system, but we're going to change that by changing what people eat. So instead of eating beef, we want you to eat a plant-based burger, right? Instead of eating, um, you know, another form of pro protein, we want you to eat insects or, you know, something that's kind of, you know, is, but it's really hard to change diets. And we see that now, you know, we had all of, so, so much investment into these spaces. And now we see the performance of, you know, companies like, you know, Beyond and Impossible really, you know, and I think, th I think those products are still highly relevant but they may not be the branded products, you know, the big blasts around the brands that we see. 
um, there. And then the fourth D is, is our disrupt model, which is also seeing a lot of investment. And that's where like, we won't change what you eat, but we're gonna change how it's produced. So um, cultivated meats, um, precision fermentation, biomass fermentation, maybe even controlled environment ag, right? Let's change how the food itself is raised and, you know, move it into a more capital intensive system, you know, shift the risk on it, you know, make it more like a, you know, a factory, um, you know, and basically move away from land-based production. So, um, you know, in all of those those are there. All of those may be viable ways to get to a more sustainable food system. And I think the opportunity is to tackle all of them. But if you're a company, you need to understand where you are and where maybe the opportunities are and where you may be, you know, under threat from, you know, um, you know, Pat Brown from Impossible says he wants to get, you know, to do away with animal agriculture by 2035. You know, that's a message that a certain group of people are hearing. So you need to to respond to that, and, you know, but doesn't mean that you can't continue to push. Oh, I, I think there's, firstly, I think all those different innovations and uh, they all have value and where, where that value sits and how much, I don't think any of them are silver bullets. I don't think the concept of a silver bullet, I think is, um, is just wrong and the more people try and look for silver bullets the more they're likely to go in the wrong direction and there's there's a balance that i would see between those different technologies or approaches and i would see the balance the challenge i think is the balance is going to be very different in different geographies or different communities um and that's both within the developing yeah. and the developed world yes yeah, it's, it's that's super super important ash because you know people look right now and say oh yeah you know, look look at these plant-based you know proteins you know they're just they're they're really you know they're collapsing in the u.s right you know the you know mark, market demand's not just stalled but it's actually falling but you know where i look for those kind of products are in asia so China, huge need for food security, right? All over Asia, you know, Singapore, 30 by 30, you know, they want to be producing 30% of their own food by, you know, by 2030, you know, you can already buy a cultivated chicken product in restaurants and there you can, you know, they are supporting strongly, you know, precision fermentation, uh, you know, cultivated meats, uh, plant-based meats, you know, controlled environment ag. So, you know, we get all caught up, you know, and I, I honestly, I think, still a little bit of hubris, right? You know, if you're in the U.S., you think that we are the world leader in technology in, you know, so many spaces. Um, I don't know if that's true anymore. I don't even know if we're relevant anymore between the U.S. and, and Europe used to control these conversations around food, right? What happened here was important. Today, I, you know, and into the future, I think you have to look to Asia, and, um, you know, the investments they're making, you know, investors like, you know, Tomasic and, and New Horizons, uh, you know, Chinese government putting, you know, cultivated meats in their five-year plan. Um, you know, those are the things that are going to shape the world of the future, rather than whether the U.S. consumer goes in and buys a, you know, a Beyond Burger off the supermarket shelf and, you know, whatever supermarket you, you're shopping at. Well, between India and China, you've got roughly a third of all the people on the planet. And then there's another third or so almost in Africa, I guess. Africa, so, right. uh, you know, the West, you know, even just obviously West has a, has a big role in many, many ways, but those different uh, geographies will have both huge implications on in terms of what gets developed and produced, but also on the ultimate sustainability of any production because of the footprints of those places. And, you know, you do have the fact that a huge percentage of the Indian population is Hindu and vegetarian. Yeah. And there's great vegetarian food in India. Yeah. It's easy to go to India and spend a month there and not eat any meat and you're yeah. less likely um, to have any digestive issues as well. Yeah. Um and then China's got a different approach to, yeah. to meat consumption as well. And they've been essentially eating fermented protein in the form of tofu for centuries. So it's a, a smaller leap um, from your beef burger here to 
uh, and all it, it it goes back to what you were saying when you were talking about sitting around the table and and the canning and then people thinking this is something amazing and new that's never been done before, whereas it's actually not as um, blue sky as as um, as one as, as many people would think. Yeah, completely. Uh, so again, so I would keep a you know strong eye on Asia for you know for technologies like that. I do think they shape you know the future of global demand for proteins, um, in particular, and proteins of course shapes the demand for everything else, right? Because of the big you know backwards kind of multiplier effect on the food system. So um, you know, I think, but I think we need it all. So that's the idea. You know, when we have you know, our four boxes in this very simple two by two matrix, you know, of, you know, defy, develop, you know, disrupt and, and, and you know, def and um, defend, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, typical two by two, you want to be moving from like defend to defy or something like that. It's like, no, like all of these boxes actually are important. They all need technology. They all need broad, broad adoption, right? And, um, it's and there are certain you know minimums that are are moving up in the world now. As I think, as we understand more about particularly about the implications of climate, right now, you know, so you know, climate is something that that's always changing. You know, it's I can remember different decades over you know my you know my life that you know my dad was selling farm equipment. You know, ten years it was like it rained all the time, and ten years it was dry all the time, right? And so the equipment you need kind of changes around that. And I think from a breeding standpoint, right, we can breed, you know, we can adapt crops to, you know, to higher temperatures or to, you know, grow with less water and things. Um, you know, Canada is clearly winning in all of this. It's kind of gets gets warmer up there. You know, I'm a strong supporter of, you know, farmland purchases in Canada. Um, you know, I think the South, it, it's, you know, gets a bit more challenging around that. But I think it's a, you know, kind of the variations. It goes back to what we were talking about, you know, how can you have an efficient system when kind of the unreliability of production is uh, a challenge, like a constant is, challenge? Is that a mindset? And I guess, I guess back in my early days working with dairy farmers in Australia, and there was, this is a slightly simplified example, but there's the guy who had a, fed the animals when they were milking them and they grazed in the paddock and he had say 28 paddocks and there was the first Monday of the month, the second Monday of the you know, and they went round. And if it was the middle of spring and grass was jumping out of the ground, they went round the same speed. And if it was the middle of the winter and there was no grass, they went round the same speed. And this whole concept, you know, the cows and the climate and the grass, they don't care whether it's Sunday and it's the weekend or whether it's Tuesday or whatever. It's, they care about moisture, sunlight, temperature, yeah. recent yeah. grazing. Yeah. And we have this concept of looking through it through our, you know, human view lens rather than saying, well, this is actually nature and all these things that we've made are actually oblivious to that. And do we need to start adapting to their cycles or the natural cycles rather than being so, especially when it comes to actually production, rather than expecting the natural cycles to adapt to us, which they won't. Yeah. Well, I think that, that I think that's a great point. Um, one of the most insightful comments I've ever heard about farming came when I was visiting a good friend of mine in New Zealand, and she was professor at Massey University, but also she and her, her husband have a what I would have described as a dairy farm, and I was was with him, and she said, "No, Mary, it's like we're not dairy farmers. What we, our job in New Zealand as farmers, is to grow grass. Our job is to grow the best crop of grass we can ever grow, and then we make a processing decision. What do we want to turn that grass into? Do we want to turn it into, you know, into to, to milk production? Do we want to turn it into, you know, beef, into sheep, into, you know, um, you know." venison and i just thought that if you kind of focus on that fundamental like we want from this soil this precious you know soil and resources we have to to do the best that we can with it right and if you're thinking about your job is growing grass maybe you move that that herd in a different rotation right in order to keep that grass right to where it comes back again and i think that you know kind of comes back to you know my view about we've got to get the focus off of, you know, the, you know, yield per acre per animal 
back into that enterprise level, right? And kind of like, let's figure out the things that really matter to, um, you know, whether it's, you know, pro sustainability, whether that's, you know, profitability, economic viability, uh, you know, social sustainability, others, um, you know, the, you know, that kind of that human sustainability piece of it into what is it that really matters? You know, is food valuable? Yes, but nutrition is more valuable than food, perhaps, right? So, you know, when we talk about do we have to value food more, I think we need to, you know, think, you know, again, that stronger, that link between, you know, what a person eats and, you know, their health, uh, you know, the cost in the U.S. today, certainly in my home state of Kentucky, uh, you know, um, to treat illnesses that are related to poor dietary choices is huge, right? Why don't we like move some of that money from treatment into, you know, kind of better foods, better diet. And, um, and it's not saying that this food is good and this food is bad. It's like, you know, that combination, again, go back to the idea, you know, what is it? Do we want to be sustainable? Is it a farm or agriculture or food or food system? Or is it a sustainable diet? You know, what does that look like? And how can we get people to, you know, to kind of the, the way that the funding works in the world, you know, these big pots of money into like shifted from this camp into something that is, you know, more, you know, not just preventative in, in, in nature, but also gives people a better quality of life, right? It's, uh, you know, kind of this aging. Now as we are getting older, um, you and I, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you want to get, you want to age with, um, you know, a, a something to where you're continue to be active, mentally active, physically active. Uh, I think there's a, a huge opportunity given so many of our current health issues are related to metabolic disease and the inflammatory response to metabolic disease and that also increasing this the increases the susceptibility to um infectious or communicable disease but also increases susceptibility to things like alzheimer's and cancers mm. and those sorts of things and and then there's this huge resource um, the amount of money that's spent on health that um to deal with these food and i guess originally food related diseases and health issues and if we can decrease the costs to the health system then that also frees up huge amounts of resources that we could then push back into into having more sustainable um food systems and energy systems and all those sorts of things and obviously that's easy to say but um implementation is is much much yeah. more challenging and there's a huge there's yeah. there's some big hurdles there well, what you, you know, you said earlier about silos, right? You know, that's a huge challenge on the human health side as well. And um, I hope those are changing. But I remember when my dad and my mom both went through, you know, severe, you know, illnesses, my dad, you know, kind of a heart condition, COPD that led to to his death, at what I would have considered, a, you know, way too early. And my mom had a, you know, had a particular type of cancer and, you know, kind of navigating that system is like every person that you met in, in that kind of the healthcare team, they were thinking about their own little silo, right? So I'm the lung doctor, right? I'm the heart doctor. I'm the person that's like the infectious disease person. It's like, nobody was thinking about that whole enterprise, right? The patient, I was talking to my own GP about it. And she's like, it's so scary, Mary. I'm scared to death that, you know, like of ever being sick because you, you know, and so how do we get this again? Just like I'm saying, I don't, I want to think about, you know, this, you know, kind of the, from an enterprise level from the farm, it's like the enterprise level of, of the person, um, you know, and that approach that's more, uh, you know, kind of based on you know, the whole human health approach as opposed to, you know, we've got these specialties here and they don't necessarily talk to each other and nobody's really thinking about, you know, a set of long-term outcomes that is, uh, you know, maybe the, you know, what would be the best for the patient, you know, starting early on, right? You know, as opposed to like treating it, you know, at the end of life. That... But there's, I think there's a similar mentality in, in, both farming and also in yeah. in traditional medicine where you have a disease or you have you say you have an insect pest 
on your crop and you are a, a weed, you go, okay, I'm going to spray something that will kill that. And it's trying, it's a, it's a very linear, single solution, single problem wrapped up in a nice, neat bow. And same with, you know, you've got a disease and be that a cancer or be that um, a certain bacterial infection or whatever. And rather than, and it's the same thing, we're going to go and treat that. We're going to treat that one issue rather than looking more holistically so it's it's this one-to-one -one rather than we're going to intervene and we want to have many many outcomes that are all working working together and I guess that's yeah. about embracing the complexity rather than trying to ignore the complexity and and yeah. boil it down to something that we can easily conceptualize yeah, that was always my challenge. I studied economics, uh, you know, at a, at a very high level. And I must say it was not a good fit because I kept accusing economists who have some of which have gone on now and won like Nobel Prizes and, you know, been like the Council of Economic Advisors or Treasury Secretaries in the U.S., you know, telling them that, you know, the, the problem with economists is they assumed all the complexity away in the world. Therefore, you know, their, their answers were never relevant, right? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and I think that's that piece. That's why I, I come back and I really like that answer of my, you know, New Zealand farmer friend who says, you know, our job is to grow grass and it's to grow the best crop of grass we can grow it. And, you know, um, it's just kind of, I think it, it's, it's hugely complex, right? But it's kind of simple, right? It's a simple answer, but the complexity about growing that wonderful crop of grass, right? And then making a processing decision is... Uh, you know, it kind of kind of changes where the goalposts are, and I think that's what you're saying as well. Oh, completely. Um, we've gone on for a while, so we probably should not, you know, yeah, keep on going too long, even though we could probably talk for another hour. I know we could talk. We could talk for days about this, and your audience is, is, might not appreciate that as much as we do. <laughs> is there anything else that we haven't discussed that you think should be mentioned? you know i don't know there, there's so many things in the world i think we we covered a lot of them right you know the um everything from the you know the the need to engage you know with with consumers to you know and in, even consumers so we need to engage with people right you know the enterprise level approach this idea about you know you need to get you know i think that you know kind of alignment around a shared vision as an industry uh and you know, technology clearly underpins so many of these solutions. I think the, the one thing I would come back to at the end, you know, this is the most important industry in the world. There's without a doubt, right? And I think the thing that we don't do enough is to make that case for our young people. And why, if they are so concerned about the world and they want to give the world a better future, that they should come and work in this industry, right? Um, and they should work at it at a, in a in a way that they can you know actually achieve scale you know that rather than these very very singular you know kind of nice you know solutions but um, that you know may not make it's like you know if you can get you know dairy cows in 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 India where there's you know something like a billion of them there's a tremendous number of dairy cows there. I mean, if you can get, you know, 1% improvement in those cows, you know, maybe that's better than focusing on getting a, you know, a bigger improvement in the US or in Australia where our herds are already tremendously productive. But um, so I think it all comes down to talent. I always end everything um, that I do with that, you know, case, that plea that we need to have, you know, that talent in this industry needs to be absolutely top notch. Um, that means that we'll be able to, to solve the, the, you know, the challenges of future. And there are many of those. And um, it's why I've dedicated a, you know, a certain portion of my career to being in an area, of, you know, at, at Harvard Business School, to where you can kind of influence that talent um, through the International, you know, Food and Agribusiness Management Association, where we work around the world to engage um, it, certainly, you know, industry and governments around these important conversations, but also a to get, you know, young people excited and to to bring them into an industry that, you know, maybe they, you know, they, they have thought about that they didn't realize the potential of, or maybe even they haven't thought about it all. So, you know, I might leave you with that, Ash, and uh, thanks for a hugely, hugely interesting conversation. 
Mary, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And um, thank you very, very much. A pleasure as always, I should say. So thank you very, very much. Uh, you're welcome. You've been listening to The Ash Cloud with me, Ash Sweeting, in conversation with Mary Shellman, recorded in California in December 2022.